Hey, we are now on episode four of the Filmmakers Anonymous show. This is actually a part two to last week's episode where we talked about some of the worst and best things of modern cinema. So we're going to be continuing our discussion because there's actually a lot more points to get to that I think will be really interesting to talk about this week. This is our weekly podcast show, The Filmmakers Anonymous Show. I'm Mike Woodard. I'm the president of Filmmakers Anonymous. And I am here joined by Tyler, who is the secretary of our club. Hi, I'm sorry. Just to be <laughs> consistent. <laughs> <laughs> secretary um, of awesome. We are joined by Amber Fisher, who is the former president of our club and is also a star of the super awesome film show, which is a similar podcast. Hi. <laughs> no there. No so high joined, energy this one joined by Matt Rowe uh, CEO of Heaven's Fire Films check us no. check out <laughs> check I was giving you the opportunity for a shameless plug you gotta jump on it Matt alright fine also check out uh, the, 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 the film review show that we have on our YouTube page as well as the Cinema Historia <laughs> sketch show uh, and we'll probably come out with those in a, in, in a little bit too and we are also joined by three prominent filmmaker members. Brianna. The only animator. The only animator in our group, which she loves to just keep beating into our heads. We wah, know! Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> we are joined by Sander. I also do some animation. Okay. See, okay. you have like a half a friend. Not, I'm, I'm not yeah. allowed just to, just to do it as a hobby. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw myself into animators. I wrote a scope, so. Oh, no, no. no. I made a stop motion. <laughs> Does that make me, huh? <laughs> I took, I took an animation class. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so I'd watch animation. Is that kind of... And we're also joined by James. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I should say, I won an award for my animation. Okay, Amber. <laughs> Ooh, cough claps all around. Oh, cough shit. claps all around. Not that, but it was the best because okay, yeah. it was a bottle of wine. <laughs> so, for those of you who maybe didn't miss last week, please uh, listen, watch last week's show. We have it up on YouTube. Um, yeah, YouTube. Watch that com. logo. Watch that logo <laughs> for the whole show. YouTube.com. You don't know U-M-B-C-F-A. that it doesn't change. It might. It might be animated. You and can't prove us wrong unless you watch it. And while we're on the topic of our social media, please tweet us at UMBCEFA. And you can also find us on Facebook by searching UMBC's Filmmakers Anonymous. We started this topic last week about the worst and best things in cinema. I don't so, remember saying anything about the best things about cinema. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, maybe it was the worst things about cinema. <laughs> we're very <laughs> negative here at Filmmakers Anonymous. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a very cynical bunch. And if you'd like to join in our conversation, yes. That's yes, not yes. our fault we cynical. It's the industry. <laughs> we, we we're are products at, of our environment. We tell Matt, like, we you tell stole like my it. line. I was going to say that exact same thing. <laughs> we keep it real over here. Except for Brianna because okay. she's an animator. So the they, Latin- they, get to, they get to keep their souls. <laughs> so <laughs> we do. <laughs> last not show, when you work for Disney. So last show we went over, okay. we were reading off of the article from the website denofgeek.com. This was an article that was done about a year ago, and it is actually, you're right, Sandra, you're correcting me properly, the 10 biggest problems with modern-day cinema, and we were giving our opinions about it. The first few were inaudible dialogue, the multiplex, um, we have the too many toys for filmmakers to play with, and the last one we did was spoiler-filled trailers. And if those don't seem familiar, go back in time and watch last week's. Yes, watch last week's, listen to it. We have it on groovespaces.com slash filmmakersanonymous, where you can also download it. Okay, so now we're going to shift our conversation uh, this week. We're going to start off with shaky cameras as the next uh, big problem. Uh, now, can, can, I, can I start I with... I think a, Matt just turned into a wolf over here I, when he heard the topic. Those cocksuckers! Uh, my, my main complaint this year has been Chernobyl Diaries. It's shot entirely in the style of found footage shaky cam, except when they show the entire group, no one's holding a camera. You saw Chernobyl Diaries? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Jacuz! So, so it's real. On. This I guy also Chernobyl. saw Battleship. I lo- uh, yeah, I this love is also Chernobyl. the only guy here who went, saw Battleship. Okay, this is, this, is Le- that they made. this is Liam Neeson Willen. from Battleship. I don't like you, Hopper. You're not good enough for my daughter, okay, Hopper. Okay. That's his character. There, I just saved you time. He never says... You sunk my battleship. If that's why you're going to Sorry. see the movie, like... I don't think anybody is going to see that movie. Rihanna's oh, in it. I've automatically it. said oh, no. Rihanna <laughs> is the best actor no. in that movie. That's how bad as the I acting said, is. As I said, I've already said no. Better than Liam Neeson. He's not even trying. He, he showed up for the day. 
got his paycheck, and left. <laughs> I played Schindler. <laughs> Fuck you all. <laughs> and I was going to um, say before you start saying about shaky cameras, because I know you ready to explode, mate. <laughs> but let me go ahead. Two movies in my um, Cyrus, the one with uh, Jonah Hill, when he um, plays the uh, gr- grown-up child. I, I've seen Cyrus, and that was actually uh, that was actually a pretty interesting movie. Uh, I I saw it like a year or so ago yeah, when that's I saw it I, recently. Yeah, yeah I, it's kind of fuzzy in my head, but actually, uh, in, in terms of the acting and the, the script and whatnot, yeah, it was very good. interesting. Uh, I don't really remember the cinematography too much, unfortunately. Oh, okay, well, it was one scene like you could tell the zoom was like zoom with the, from the camera, not oh. like a dolly shot. So it was like zoom, and then like stutter too. Oh, it was just like yeah. You could when they were sitting down in the living room. Oh, there's a uh, there's one movie which uh, it, it goes down to like I don't have a problem with handheld. I mean, there's a difference between handheld and shaky cam. Uh, one movie that I think would have been really great if they got a different director. Uh, is a movie called The Libertine uh, that has <laughs> yeah. There's Johnny Depp, John Malkovich. Uh, uh, I can't. Remember, I, th- I think Samantha I Morton's think in it. You're the only people that's seen that movie. I, I actually <laughs> like. Uh, it's ri- it's based <laughs> off of a play, and it's actually the screenplay is written by the playwright Stephen Jeffries, and it's about uh, John Wilmot, the poet. <laughs> and uh, there's this one scene at the end, and especially, and this really fucking pissed me off uh, that. Uh, Johnny Depp's character, John Wilman, is giving this speech to the House of Lords, which basically is just Parliament. <laughs> and he's walking around the House of Lords, and he's doing a really great job. He's doing a really great speech. He's uh, he's really into the character and whatnot. He's all fucked up. He's all fucked up. He's dying of syphilis and shit like that. So, like, you know, he's really into Ace the character. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is this. The director, Lawrence Dunmore, uh, he's a music video director. And actually, the only thing he did involving uh, actual film before this movie was designing ending credits on a film in like 1997. I really hate the fact that they actually got this. They could have gotten so many other good directors to do this movie uh, right. Uh, But the thing is, the final scene where he's walking around the House of Lords, not only is the director, uh, because I've also seen the behind the scenes footage, that not only is the director Lawrence Dunmore holding the camera, and he's like he's moving backwards. He's moving backwards uh, to follow his movement, and that can be fine. That can work, but this is the problem. Every single every single time he moves backwards, the camera goes out of focus, yeah. and you can hear his footsteps. <laughs> that is the epitome of that. And this movie was made for like almost ten million dollars, so this is no reason why this should have happened. And like, and he shot the entire movie handheld, which you really didn't need to do, uh, because it, it's like a it's well, a romantic right. it's, it's a it's a piece about the libertine culture in 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 uh, England and France and whatnot. So, but at the end, like. It drove me up the goddamn wall. And actually, one thing that really pisses me off, like, when it comes down to shaky cam, I guess, like, the, the, the biggest explanations of what shaky cam is, uh, for me, like, the bad elements of shaky cam is uh, paranormal activity. Uh, you know, that one has... It's 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 a lot smoother than... Uh, it well, it could have been mean, a lot but of... it is shaky cam because it's... It, cause yeah. Most of the time, it's somebody with a camera, so you, it, that's part of the experience. Yeah, I mean... It, I, it, and there can be... And there's movies that are worse than that. Cloverfield. I mean. To be yeah, honest, I in my know. opinion, Cloverfield is one of those films it's where really, the, handicap, the I handicam, the understand. shaky cam, right? Yeah, I understand the, the shaky cam of but the film. But I'm when so you startled. can't see, when right. you can't tell what the hell's happening, right? Exactly. And you can't, and you're like, where are they? What's that? Like, then it's kind of. And the fact bad. that, and the fact that you have to sit there and watch it. For you know, over an hour and, and a half. Like, and what the, the fuck now, is going on? Now, the article does point out in some movies that do use the shaky cam, which, as I think everybody knows, really got popularized with uh, yeah, the Bourne right. series. Well, well, of course. And, and I mean, and I mean, yes, then, there are other examples yeah, yeah. too. Too. I mean, I love the Bourne films, and the writer, the author of this article, Simon Brew, he makes a good point in that. The Bourne films wouldn't have been as exciting without that. The shaky cam oh, yeah. element was an element in that film because it was a film about espionage. It was about car chases. It was about you know. Well, they got all like, that sort of stuff. They got so. really like when it came to the action stuff, they were like all in your face. Where right. usually you have like a nice like you know with right, all the other right. stuff. Right, right. And There's that a and it's and and made the movie more because I just recently watched all of them um, raw. Yeah, right, right. Even exactly. though the, even though the first movie. 
was kind of boring. But the other two, oh, were, I, the I other agree. two were better. And I even agree. the newer one it's, had a more had another like shaky cam in your face kind of. Right. I, but I think it, I might actually yeah. disagree with you on that one. But with the, the legacy, no. Well, it but, comes down between. Uh, Born Identity being uh, the most boring out of all of them. Well, I, I, I fell asleep and then tried watching again and fell asleep again. And, then, and, and I, I, I fell asleep during the big action scene at the end. But I'm saying... Um, <laughs> so, no, she doesn't find it boring. No. <laughs> um, but, granted, sometimes the how it's incorporated into a film, if, you know, it can be, you know... It right. can help it. Sometimes it right. can't. And, and an example that I think of how it doesn't help sometimes is a more recent film, The Hunger Games. Because I like that, that was really bad. And, and, that, and that, and yeah, I there, agree There were that. a few things that were wrong with both the cinematography of that film, as well as the editing. Um, and uh, That just didn't and, make any sense uh, well, at all. And it's just the problem is that you're trying to establish a world that has a unique environment, but you're going to give us these two-second quick shaking looks during, at during the environment. During a dream? During some, like, <laughs> random nightmare dream? Right. I'm like, I don't even well, know. Well, and, well, even, like, the first scene of the film, you know, like, they're showing, like, the main characters, I think, walking to the actual place. Mm -hmm. and, and at then first they I'm like, like, is this a documentary? They, well, right, and they would do, Shot like, on location in North Korea. They would do cutaways. They would do yeah. cutaways to people in the environment, and the cutaways are shaking like crazy. I'm like... And, it, and it's only a three second shot, so then it cuts back to that main shot. So I'm like, why even bother, why bother doing a handicam if you're only going to show us three seconds of in a the shot? Beginning, I and think they were trying to ratchet no. up the tension and stress in that crowd. But it, but it didn't. Wait, yeah, no, I know, I agree. This, I'm this saying this what they were trying the, to do. The, the opening of the movie. Right, and exactly. And nothing Not was a, happening right, yet. Well, no, but, no but, but right, but we were supposed to feel stressed because... If we knew what was going on, I'm not saying that it was done well. I'm mm -hmm. saying that I think the reason they did it is because this is a stressful situation for them. This is a high, you know, high risk situation for them, where they're, where, you know, if you don't know the Hunger Games, shame on you. But um, <laughs> I guess shame on me. Yeah, shame, shame on you, man. man. I haven't read the book. I but, haven't seen the movie. But but, uh, but they were trying to get us as, you know, stressed out as the characters. They failed to do that. Right, right, and and that's the problem is that you don't it get was, you don't feel that. It was just that. wrong, wrong cinematography. Right, right. It didn't make any sense. The well, cinematography. The fourth romance was in the book too. Right, and that's, that's not what we're talking about. Though. Don't talk about it. Right, yeah, yeah. No, yeah let, let's it's try the, to keep it focused here. Like, right. we were talking we're about, talking it about just shaky didn't, camera. It just it wasn't. It could have been. It could have been done well. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. And like right. I said, like with like with the born identity, like we said, they used it a lot with like the action stuff. It could have done been done well when, like in the in the book in the story, they're like in that like the woods and everything in the arena. Mm -hmm. I could have understood that because it's raw, it's dynamic. You want to feel the attention, and they did use that in some parts. It was good, but then during other, it's just it was really sloppy. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't like the the director on that movie. I thought he sucked because it was like who would like none of these shots were good. It yeah, wasn't they're... like it wasn't like oh it's kind of good. It's like. It's just not a there, good shot. There, there were some shots of, like, back of characters' heads that they just threw in there for, like, as parts of yeah. jump cuts. Like, they, they would do, like, three se sequential jump cuts, and one of them was just the back of the head shot It kind of no was reason, like somebody that kind of, like, they had around. an idea. They had a, a, they had something in their head of, like, okay, I want to do it like this, but they just didn't know how to do it. My, if uh, that makes sense. There's a really mm -hmm. good explanation. Uh, I think uh, there are two movies that come to mind when it comes down to really good use of shaky cam mm -hmm. and really bad use. Uh, a really bad one for me uh, was Public Enemies by Michael Mann. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I was really excited to see that movie because I'm a big fan of Michael Mann. And to be honest, actually, Michael Mann made shaky cam popular. Mm -hmm. He was the guy who brought it into the whole thing. Like he came, he was the guy who created Miami Vice, and like you know, he was the guy who like. <laughs> He's really good with shaky cam, but he uses shaky cam, he uses handheld camera to the entirety of Public Enemies. Even when they're sitting down and talking at a dinner table, I'm like, still, moving camera and stuff like that. I'm like, it just felt like, okay, we're in the 30s, like, you know, or a gangster period, and somebody has a video camera, and they're shooting this yeah. all up in because their face. And that's the other thing, it was shot on digital. It yeah. was shot, it was a very easily shot, but the... the the really the best I, I think one of the best examples of steady cam and it's usually cut between two different movies for me but I'm gonna go for like it usually is cut between two movies for me a Clockwork Orange and American Beauty 
Uh, but uh, I'm going to go for American Beauty for this one because uh, Sam Mendes, I, I, I watched an interview with him and he was talking about the use of, of uh, handheld camera. There are only two handheld camera shots in the entirety of that film and they're used for a very specific reason mm -hmm. and it's exactly why handheld should be used in the first place is to increase kinetic atmosphere. It is to increase the kineticism of the people in the scene. There's only two parts in which that has happened, and that's when someone is getting punched mm -hmm. in the entire movie. Everything else is either on a dolly, a tripod, something. If it's moving, it's smooth as fuck. Now, I guess it's because I'm very Kubrickian, and I'm very much from that school. And nice, like, you know, the nice Portman, too. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm, very, like, I'm very much like, because it goes back to A Clockwork Orange. It's like, you know, A Clockwork Orange has tons of handheld shots in there, mm -hmm. but they are used to during fight sequences and whatnot. Which, it, it, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. makes sense. And I can't stand when people use handheld camera unnecessarily because there's no point to it. Uh, you use... Cinematography is used to increase the emotion or increase the attitude of a scene. It's all about conveying mood. And if you have bad cinematography, you've got a bad movie, even if all the other elements work. If the cinematography sucks, then, you know, it's not going to, you're going to, you're always going to have, have mercy on uh, your soul. You're going to have a bad taste in your mouth and for the it, entirety of the film. An example of that is, um, that I believe, Quantum of Solace, the 007 sequel mm -hmm. that not really a whole lot of people really liked. Yeah. Um, and me, me included, but one of the reasons what is why. A, what is a Quantum of Solace? Like, how do you have a what is a quantum and how do you solace it? I don't know. I, the movie didn't answer it that question. It sounds James Bond. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, I mean, I, but, I personally but, have never been a fan of the James Bond the, movies in and of itself. Uh, but the opening, uh, there's a you know a chase sequence. Bond chases down um, a suspect, and it eventually leads into like a a bull running ring or like a yeah. horse running ring or something like that. And he chases him all the way through. I didn't understand what was going on in the chase scene. Because you couldn't. Because it was cutting so fast between yeah. this guy's movements well, and that, Bond's movements. Well, that's also, kind of that's less editing. about cinematography and that's more about editing. I would, I'd well, say right, the first the, right. uh, Casino Royale, the opening where the fighting in the bathroom, that's all handheld. Yeah, and well, that, and that made, and that was going back from two scenes with him beating the shit out of the one guy in the bathroom and then like the nice kind of right, right. cinematography yeah. with him talking to the guy. So it was switching back and forth from two different scenes. But that worked because right. one, we're getting a new bond. They they said they, they wanted, wanted to get to it grittier, him. all up in your face, I liked and it. you want to beat the shit out of somebody, and that worked right. perfectly. It's right. increasing kineticism. Well, yeah. it's, it, right. it does what and, it needs to do, and it worked for Casino Royale because I always define Casino Royale as basically. I mean, there were moments of action. Yeah, there were like you know a mm -hmm. few minutes of action, but after that, it was long periods of just steady of just steady work and like at, and just dialogue, pretty much. And it's and, kind of know, funny. Espionage. And even like I think I don't know, but they I think they used the, they used a mixture also of the next big scene in that movie when he had to chase the guy all over the place. That you know the mm. the guy with the backpack in the beginning and he threw up the thing. Right, like, that right. was a mixture because you. Get a little bit when oh, they're going in the, the crowd. Scene in Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, right, and they're so going you up get, the construction. You get like really nice shots where you know they're like on a crane or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you get when he gets right into it and fights them. Right. You know yeah. it's all over the place, but then it mixes back and forth. So I think it, it can work, mm -hmm. but like again, you have to you have to know what you want to portray. Yeah, mm -hmm. and like you said, the kinetic energy, the atmosphere of everything. And it's kind of funny that you guys bring up the uh, the James Bond movies, considering the fact that I brought up, you know, Sam Mendes' philosophy, because he is doing the next Bond film. Right. And so, like, yeah. he's doing Skyfall. So, like, that is actually the yeah, only I reason I want to go see is because Sam Mendes is doing see, it. we tie everything in yeah. here perfectly on the film. <laughs> we, the show. we, we. <laughs> I hope yeah, Skyfall. We're like Peter Gassaway. We bring it all in the end. I hope Skyfall is kind of like Nightfire, where it's like a big outer space laser death ray <laughs> because that's the only way to i mean with with something like skyfall it has to be an orbiting doomsday weapon like if not, it's not it, 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 right but it's if it's probably a code if it, reference but if it's for not something. i'll be sorely disappointed well i think it's going to be sorely disappointed. I, 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 i'm pretty exactly sure do. in the trailer and also <laughs> i i seriously <laughs> i seriously doubt sam mendes would do a movie like that either and also they're getting Adele to do the bond theme for the next film. That, what? and yeah. and actually going back to our discussion from last time about trailers mm -hmm. that 007 trailer is nice because yeah. it doesn't give away anything it, and you gives really you really don't have no idea what it, the hell's other than Harry Bardem is creepy be looking and is the bad guy. Right, exactly. Exactly. Otherwise, you don't know what's happening in that film. You just you see, ding, 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 and that's it. 
And that, that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People still want to see it. Right. And, and exactly. Time. And right. It's something new. All right. So the next topic we're going to jump to. Um, the next point that he has in his article is um, an unwillingness to end a story. And what he's referring to is more like where you don't just really make feature films of something anymore. You can, you know, branch out into TV shows, comics, okay. spin offs. I didn't know if you were talking like about like something like Inception. Well, he actually yeah. does mention Inception as the antithesis. I believe I'm using that word correctly. You Please. Are. Okay, at, yeah, of, yeah. of this point. Yeah. Is because Inception was a good beginning, middle, and story. There's nothing else to it. Mm -hmm. This is Inception. You're not going to see anything else. Well, I liked, I know, like, like if we're talking about this, like, I know some people had problems with Inception, but I liked, I liked how Nolan like, used it because I, I liked it how it was like, you, you, everybody watched it could get two, di like, different things. Yeah. Like, it's like, right. no, he's still in the dream. No, he right. was whatever. It's you the know? ambiguity. Yeah. It right. makes and it much more interesting. some people don't like that. Some people are like, I need to know how this ended. Well, <laughs> or I need a sequel to figure <laughs> to it out. To be honest, to And I'm that. like, fuck you. Just use your imagination. He was a flying space pirate the entire time. <laughs> this brings me, actually, uh, uh, Michael Haneke, mm -hmm. who is one of my favorite German directors, uh, he had this really great quote saying that art is about asking questions. If you want answers, look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and art really, it, it, I feel that in, in film is like one of the epitomes of that. Like some movies, if you actually had to end the story, it would not be nearly as good as it was. Mm -hmm. um, like all the, like probably one of the best examples are movies that are especially that are surreal. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at any of David Lynch's films and he actually brought a point to the end of it, they would lose all all sustainability with you and I. If you actually, like, if he actually at the end of Lost Highway, which is a cluster fuck of a movie and whatnot. Well, it's David Lynch. I mean, no, it's David Lynch. I love it. I mean, I, I love David. Yeah. I love David Lynch's movies and whatnot. I think the only movie of his that actually had a one hundred percent clearly definable ending was The Elephant Man, and that was the most mainstream of any of his movies he's yeah. ever done. But. The thing is, like, if you added an ending that explained everything in Lost Highway, or even Mulholland Drive, for that matter, which is one of my favorite movies, it would have completely lost all of the impact of the movie, and also there would be nothing left to, you know, imagine. Like, if, if mm -hmm. at the end of Inception and whatnot, mm -hmm. that you actually figured out if it just kept spinning and whatnot, or if it fell over, I mean, it, it, would, it, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have caught you no. just like like the film yeah. did no. the fact there's, that there's so many like it left like, it yeah ambitious. with that or it's or like you could have yeah. like I in your speak. own head you could have ended it with oh uh he, he made it right he he didn't make it in my mm -hmm. in my own head though when i was watching that movie i mean i like i liked it so much because um i usually some of the time i can figure out how you know we're watching so many movies i can figure out where they're going mm -hmm. and the entire time i'm like his wife is right and, his and, wife is right. And, and, you know what, when and I that, and to me, when I see that ending, I go, "His wife was right, and, and I was right." And but honest, they're not telling me I'm right, so I think I like this. But so some right. people will be like, "Fuck you." It leaves it up to it the audience to think about it. When I first saw that ending, um, that was actually my initial reaction. And I think, and I thought, and, but, a and, lot and, of and when, I, when I watch it, and I, when I watch it over and over again, I'm just like. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've sort of backed off of that. That was just yeah. like, a, that was sort of like a spit out of my mouth, just because I was, was shocked by that ending. Yeah. I was just like, what? The fuck? She was right. Well, well or um, was she? I think. Yeah. Well, I, my, I, had, oh. I, I think part of it is just that people are used, people are used to kind of being just fed most like mainstream media, and the yeah. problem is a lot of it is just watered down so much to make a coherent story that fits neatly in a box. Yeah. You know, people, a lot of people, they want to. Let's let's get real. Not everyone saw Inception to learn to like to watch a movie about themes about reality. They wanted to see Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, they wanted to see Leonardo DiCaprio. They wanted to see um, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Yeah, that guy's name. They, they wanted to see them fight in action scenes. Ellen they Page, wanted to see Tom Hardy. They I just wanted to see them in tight effects. suits. Yes, but... yeah. <laughs> they wanted some cool special effects. Yeah. Amber's not, proving your point. They wanted, <laughs> a lot of people just wanted to be a normal heist film and nothing more. So that ending probably really messed with them because they're used to just seeing things. Or it's also because it's, it's Christopher Nolan, so <laughs> Batman, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And then they'd be like, it's Speaking of Nolan and Batman, I had an, I had an issue with 
the end of Dark Knight Rises. Spoiler alert. Super uh, big spoiler no. alert. Oh, wait. That Tyler, was... uh, you should leave the room. No, 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 is related to Nolan, um, because I've watched, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'd watched uh, Memento for the first time not too long ago, oh, wow. and I realized something, like, that I felt that the ending was not ambiguous enough, and I, I felt, like, spoiled because of Inception. <laughs> are, you, are you talking about the ending or the beginning? The oh, beginning. No. He's, he's talking about the beginning. No, well, so oh, <laughs> Everybody knows Inception's okay. backwards, but go ahead. Uh, Beginning. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, well, Memento's backwards. Memento. You said Inception. Yeah, you did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Inception is upside okay. down. Inception's upside down. I meant the part about whether or not um, the uh, one, I forgot his name, the uh, older guy was lying to... Uh, Lenny? Yes. Yeah. One, whether or not Lenny was lying or telling the truth about being a cop. and mm -hmm. But I felt like that because if like all the facts fit in so well that he's telling the truth, that there's no reason to believe that he is lying, which I felt like coming off of Inception, like I, w I didn't expect that from Nolan. Like it was too, like... <laughs> too definitive. It made too much yeah. sense, basically. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, like, uh, yeah, like it, it spoils your view when you look at a, a filmmaker's most recent works and you go back to some of their other stuff. Uh, like, sometimes it changes. It's yeah. funny they how it messes. Change, yeah. Right, I it mean, messes you your see view how of they, them. They switched. Or, or, how, they yeah. de or yeah. how they developed, or how they were originally. I mean, if you watch Lord of the Rings compared to The Frighteners. Which was done by Peter Jackson, yeah. for example. Yeah, that, that you can. How he goes or from you could the go fighters, back to, um, dead alive, dead alive. And whatnot, like, or heavenly, or he, what was it, heavenly, bad, heavenly, bad heavenly creatures? Yeah, oh, yeah. heavenly creatures. creatures. That's exactly. Like you, That's what it was. Yeah, like that. Out of all of his stuff, you're like, this guy made that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Now going back to our point. Yeah. Um, one of the films we that one? this is this is an odd like an oddball film to throw into this topic. The Boondock Saints. I haven't seen it. Oh, really? Uh, I, you show it. I've, I've been, with, I've been right. in the same room with the Boondock uh, Saints <laughs> and sat next to one of the guys that I didn't realize. Norman Reedus or Sean Patrick No, Bonner? but I do love Norman Reedus. But I saw both of them. No, it was some Everybody's other guy. Fan of some other guy, the third guy. Whatever the third of, guy. Oh, Rocco. Rocco. Uh, I was Rocco? sitting next to him David waiting for my Rocco? friend to come out of the bathroom. And then they got <laughs> up and went to... And Norman Reedus and them were talking to some girls. And this guy was sitting next to me. And I was just waiting for my friend to like get out of the bathroom. And he's like, do you know who you were sitting next to? Turn to go. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason I bring it up is because the film is ba the film ends. It, it's a complete story in of itself, and yes, they just recently made a sequel, like maybe two years ago. <laughs> two years, and they are making a third. But the sequel didn't take place till like ten years yeah. after the first one. Yeah, and almost exactly ten years after. Right, right, exactly, and because Troy Duffy's a dick. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you and could and tell the way that Space Scott. <laughs> if only we could have like a picture collage, the many faces of Matt during the podcast. Um, we could totally do that. The whole point of the ending of the first movie was that it was one of those ongoing stories where mm -hmm. it, it ends very dubiously, where the the saints who you know become like vigilantes, pretty much like the main point of that film was that they kill off criminals mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Now they do. Let's, I'm not gonna trying not to reveal the whole thing, but basically it ends on just like a the story is ongoing type mm -hmm. note. Where it's not like a to be continued. They just they Yeah. They, it's not like it, it's, it's about their legend. Yeah, it's, it's like not they like become a legend mm -hmm. after the end of the film. They didn't set up a sequel. Yeah, that's exactly the point. Right. They just it's like the end of the fa of the social network where yeah. Facebook where he's just tapping away at Facebook because Facebook is an ongoing. It kinda thing. just ends in a, in but, a way. But yes. it ends in like, okay. I all right, right. You, know, you got yeah, the story. Like, you got that, it. That's the point I'm getting yeah. to: is that you understood the story of the Boondock Saints, well, and they left 
whatever would happen, and until they made the sequel, they left whatever happened after that to your imagination, yeah. and then they made a sequel and ruined and the whole thing. And that's fine <laughs> for some movies, and then for, for others, like, uh, depending, I think sometimes it also depends on how how much or how, you know, how much you like that movie and those mm-hmm. characters that you'd be like, okay, even though it ends that way, you'd be like, I wouldn't mind seeing a sequel. Right, right. And, like, my favorite but movie, yeah, but, sequel. like, my favorite movie is Heather's, and yeah. I, even though I'd, like, love to see a, a movie with the original cast, even though I know they're gonna fucking turn into a TV show and I'm gonna kill somebody, but, um... <laughs> Please don't kill me, I like to live. No, that's... No, it's the people that are going to... Okay. But, anyway, He said but, somebody, so I was worried. No, but, like, even though I would love to see where certain characters have gone with that, even though uh. I know they'll probably fuck it up, like, <laughs> but, um, I'm okay with them not making it. And even though it, it kind of ends right. in an ambiguous way where you kind of know what's gonna... You kind of don't really know how everybody's gonna turn out, mm-hmm. but it's... You know. Right, you want that continuation. I mean, it's so good that, yeah, I would love mm-hmm. if they did a sequel right. Right, if they but did But right I love it as a standalone <laughs> film, too. Well, uh, and that's fair. the funny thing is, like, I think probably one of the most well-known movies that has an ambiguous ending that no one really ever thinks of, considering how old it was, it was the original Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the thing is, at the end of that movie, it, you could very well set it up for a sequel, but if you look at it as a standalone you, film, yeah. y- it could end right there and leave well, the rest of it to your imagination. It That's was exactly what Star was. Wars. It now, the thing is, now you can't say the same thing about The Empire oh, Strikes yeah. Back because yeah. the way that they ended, like, you need connected. to wrap it up yeah. because right. that's the way it was. But, at the, but when it comes down to the first movie, it works as a standalone right. film. Probably actually another really Star good Wars. example of it uh, is one of my favorite uh, like supernatural horror films. It's called, I don't even know if you guys have ever even heard about it. It's called The Prophecy. And it, it yeah. stars Christopher Walken and Elias Coteus. And uh, this movie is is polarized and whatnot. A lot of people think it's shit. A lot of people think it's great. Well, I, they I made like 50 it. sequels to it. So. <laughs> like, yeah, and actually only, and only two of them had anything to do with the first one. Uh, but the thing is, the... The end of that movie, like it, it's ambiguous to a point in which that it could be a sequel, but at the same time, it leaves the rest up to your imagination. And I think that endings like that, and, and the, but the thing is, at the same time, we're talking about these movies that did wrap up the story in some mm-hmm. way. Where one of the problems is is not wrapping up the story. Actually, to uh, to uh, quote something that I just saw, the master, mm-hmm. the way that it ends, I'm obviously not going to say how it ends, but at the same time, it's almost impossible for me to describe how it ends because of the way it's structured and set up. Mm-hmm. The master is done in such a way that you walk out of that movie feeling like if, if you, especially if you're not used to Paul Thomas Anderson movies, you walk out of that movie with just this one <laughs> word in your mind. It's like, huh? <laughs> it's like, well, what, I mean, like, what, what the Anderson, fuck did you like, just watch? A lot of his like endings, like with like Boogie Nights. Mm-hmm. You don't know what, well, other than seeing, you know, how Boogie Nights ends, but that <laughs> character that you follow around, like, it's kind of like the beginning of a new resurgence, right. but you don't know how that's going to happen. Just like at the end of There Will Be Blood. There Will Be like, Blood, it kind of just like, yeah. I'm finished. <laughs> and I don't remember Punch I thought it was more like that much, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't think like, I've actually seen that. No. Okay, so yeah, let's move on to our next topic. Now, we were talking about stories that never end. Let's talk about movies that feel like they never end. Uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the next car, article. Car franchise that's come from, you know, right. kind of oh, well, it. I, I guess we could well, talk about also awesome anything like franchise from Eli movie. Roth. But, but the, what this oh, article God. is talking about, movies that go on for too long. And I love one of uh, the examples in, Which in this is? article. What are the examples? Knocked Up. And I totally agree with yeah. his statement that it's a comedy that goes on for over two hours, uh. and, it, and it becomes and so, so serious. Point, so 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 well, 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 right, well, right. And I and, will trump you on that. I will that, <laughs> do it. That, that, that from the same director. Uh, uh, fuck the oh, the one with Adam Sandler and what's Adam Sandler and um, oh. and sh- not jo- um, Seth, Seth Rogen. Rogen. Um, it's a uh, oh, the one where he's dying. Really the dumbest movie ever, not funny, Never and it, it kept on going. It, it was like going. two movies in one, and I'm like, one, not funny, <laughs> two, way too long. Right. I wanted to shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, like what? And the reason knocked I, up wasn't as bad. At least but, knocked up. But see, the reason yeah. I agree with the knocked up thing is that it was two hours of Seth Rogen. Just it was just two hours. Ken Jeong was funny though. Who? Wait, who? Say it again. I didn't hear the you. The doctor at the end of it. Well, at the end, but 
does. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah but that, that's a funny scene. But the whole point is that your movie is two hours long, and for the entire movie, it's, hey, Seth, why don't you just say whatever you want. Do something want, wacky, Seth. Whatever you want, and come up with, you know, as many, um, you know, cusses or dirty jokes you can think of in but, a scene. But also, that's, I mean, it is an Apatow movie, and also... And that's and, how and Seth, it's a Seth Rogen, Rogen movie, so it also can be like, well, if you don't like Seth Rogen, and if you don't like Apatow's movie, then don't watch it, because you, you get you get the same cast of characters over and over again. You get the that type of comedy. Um, so sometimes it depends. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't mind Knocked Up. I, I like it. I think it's a funny movie. I think, I mean, yeah, it could be too long, and that could just be an editing choice, too. It's just be like, there's probably scenes that probably aren't needed in it, but something like, like I said, like funny people or whatever mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. too long it wasn't a good script it, it it had seth rogan in it but it i mean he wasn't in it as much mm -hmm. but it was just you know like right. too long for right. a simple story seth, seth rogan some, oh i'm oh, sorry no, go ahead yeah. no I, I go think, ahead Brandon. i think some of it is just like the filmmaker self-indulgence like i mean judd apatow was kind of known for that yeah just kind of indulging in seth rogan and, his, and indulging in apatow's own sense of humor where he can just go on for jokes all at a time. It's some of it which can be defined as mumble core. And, and really also it's like, part. I think it's also a thing too, if it, when you have the writer and the and director mm -hmm. having both, and mm -hmm. that, you know, with writers being so close to the script, and then when them being the director, that's like, they don't want to cut cut and their stuff like, out. Yeah. Well, you spe well yeah, I mean, one... You gotta uh, kill your baby. There's, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's, there's two, there's, like, there's one, there, I think actually uh, one movie... Uh, that really did, and I wouldn't say that necessarily in and of itself as a whole thing it went on too long. There were parts of it that could have been trimmed way down. Yeah. I, all right. Uh, I'm a big fan of David Lean. Uh, you know, he's the guy who did the epics like Lawrence of Arabia and whatnot. Now, mm -hmm. the thing is with Lawrence of Arabia, even though that movie is like four hours long, there's never a wasted moment of it. And it's You're, an epic. Yeah, it's so an epic. it's going to be long. You're yeah. going to... But the thing is, at the same time, one of his movies, which I still really like, uh, is another epic of his, Dr. Zhivago, mm -hmm. which is another four-hour-long movie. But the thing is, at the same time, especially toward the end, there are scenes that go on for, like, 10, 15 minutes, which I'm used to, but, like, they, they don't... They just... They, they meander. Yeah. Actually, one movie... Especially that meanders way, way too fucking much. And this is a hard thing for me to say. Andre Tarkovsky's movie Nostalgia. There is a scene in which that it takes 15 minutes where you are watching a guy take off his boots and get into bed. That is literally the entirety the of the scene. Is that the movie that begins with the burnt out house? Mm, I think, no, I think that's Mirror. Oh, yeah, uh, it is. And whatnot, Thank but you. yeah, but no, like nostalgia. Like that is a movie that literally goes on for way too fucking long. And also, I've seen Solaris. I've seen Stalker. Stalker and whatnot, pulls it off. Pretty like, well. But the thing is, yeah. those are long movies, but they they do pull it off well. But it just it, it rambles too much. Now, like when it comes down to uh, writer directors not wanting to cut their scripts down, uh, a really good example of someone who who knows usually a good combination of two is Quentin Tarantino. Mm -hmm. Like he. Yeah. He does make long movies like Inglorious Bastards was a long it. movie, but you, the thing but is though you, every yeah. he uses every that was ounce a fun of it. Movie, yeah, Bastards. and that's exactly it. Like you know, also like Pulp Fiction Pulp is a Fiction's long movie good. too, Pulp but Fiction's they use good. every single frame. They don't waste anything. But I think that it, yeah. like again, it, it depends on who it is. Like like you said, like with like Tarantino. Yeah. Tarantino is a really good writer, and he you know, and just being somebody that you know is a fan of, of cinema, mm -hmm. I'm he knows like. Every, he understands like, the he audience. He understands it, so if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I'm sure, like, I don't know if he edits his own movies. I wouldn't be surprised. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. No. No, I know. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Rodriguez but, edits his yeah, own movies. Yeah, which maybe he should take some lessons. But, um, <laughs> yeah, like, like it's it just like, so. it's just like, you know, it's punch for punch and yeah. everything kind of, you know, it keeps the audience together being but when such you go a, off well yeah but being such an avid fan of movies Tarantino understands yeah. the audience he understands himself uh, I mean and like, the audience and you get and Tarantino's been around for so long that he has his core yeah, audience he's got a that cot. come to that because they're like I'm coming to if Tarantino made a five hour long movie go. I'd still people watch would it go see it I would they know it's like well it's five hours long who the fuck cares it's Quentin Tarantino it must be great <laughs> but, and, and, and even going down to like you know what some of his more under uh, his more lower rated films like actually one movie that a lot of people says meanders is the movie Death Proof 
uh, yeah, and nice. whatnot. No, but to be honest, actually, I never was bored in it. Now, I did see the director's cut, which adds a lot of extra stuff in there, and I'm like, this actually does need to be trimmed mm-hmm. down. And yeah. the, the actual theatrical cut of the movie worked, in my opinion. Now, when it comes down to Tarantino's, uh, his style being very, very concise, very, you know, uh, stuck to his framework, Death Proof does meander. But at the same time, you go into a Tarantino movie to enjoy the dialogue. Yeah. That is his gift. I mean, it's like you go into a, a movie or a play written by Tony Kushner. Yeah. You know, Angels in America is a six-hour-long play. But you know what? It's my favorite play ever written, and I actually sat through it twice in one day. So I sat in the same theater for 12 straight hours, and I still didn't get bored. Yeah. But... At the same time, not every director, writer, whatever, like the, the, the production team can't always pull it off. Uh, I think uh, one director who actually can handle long films really well is David Fincher. Uh, Zodiac is a very long film. But, and also, like, people went into, into that movie expecting a serial killer film and whatnot because it's the Zodiac Killer, but it's not. It's entirely right. focused on the people who are trying to solve it, and, and it's, it's right. a it's long, on the long history movie. Itself. And, and I was never bored. Film. I was never bored with that movie. Also, the one movie from David Fincher I think that did run too long was The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Yeah, that is a really And I really don't movie. blame him. I blame the writer because the writer of that was also the guy who wrote Forrest Gump. And the thing is, I'm not a fan of Forrest Gump. Uh, I think it's, it's a good okay. movie. I think it's overrated. Um, but the thing is, that. though, the original Curious Case of Benjamin Button was like a 10-page short story from Scott yeah. Fitzgerald, I and they turned it into a three-hour epic. I'm like, there's three no reason for time. that. Also, how was he born yeah. full-size? That really bothered he me. Wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't. In the book, he was. Yeah. In the book, he in was. Book? Yeah. But I'll, then it, it's a uh, book. Yeah. <laughs> I was also annoyed because the short story took place in Baltimore, and then they moved it to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. That's because they needed to bring Katrina into that. <laughs> it's also because Maryland charges way too fucking and, much. And actually, just to delve back, Matt, on your point about the Zodiac, I just saw that movie not that long ago, and I do remember at one point telling myself, wow, this movie has gone on for a while. But it was interesting. Yeah. So it, it's like, it was one of those things where I was noticing baby. the lane. But yeah, it, but, but it didn't bother you. Right, it wasn't yeah. one of those times where it bothered me. It was well, one where I was like, wow, I'm surprised yeah. it's really going on. Going on that and that's the same way I felt about Pulp Fiction and Inception. Yeah. Because like Inception, when I first watched it, I didn't see it in I later on. It ain't mm-hmm. for like two and a half hours, for like an hour. It goes by so quick. Yeah. Yeah. Inception yeah. especially, it, it, people say it's a long film. It's a quick-paced long film. Thank you. I was glad to say you know, it, quick it pace. It, exactly. It just, yeah. Let's um, let's yeah. quicken our pace a little well, bit. Well, actually, there's <laughs> one other movie that a lot of people do think meanders a lot, but at the same time, if you cut a single goddamn scene out of it, it would fall apart. And to be honest, it's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, though, yeah, bomb, it is a long-ass bomb, movie. And, bomb, and, like, yeah, bomb, even bomb, just the opening bomb, credits bomb, alone bomb, take bomb, 15 bomb, minutes to yeah. take well, place. the ship is long, too. Everything in that movie is long. Matt, yeah, right. Right. It's that, one that giant piece of phallic all, imagery. Over each other. The movie starts off, like, with a black screen and the, and the audio, and I was like, and for the first couple of minutes, I was thinking, is my, is the video not coming up for some reason? Yeah. <laughs> and then it does. And, 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 and now the funny thing is, like, you know, if, if the, the production, if the actual producers knew exactly what movie Kubrick was making, he never would have gotten that well, thing. That's why he made all his movies. Oh, uh, well, well, the thing is, well, the, <laughs> that's a completely different, entirely different yeah. podcast. I could talk for days about Kubrick, but. All I kind of right. want to challenge you to do that. Now, the last, the last yeah. topic not we now. are going to cover, yeah. um, before we get to some of our, uh, some of the comments on our discussion thread uh, posted by you, um, listeners, you. hopefully. <laughs> um, Listen to us. The audience Please. itself. It's a stage. The audience. As one of the worst yeah. things in cinema. It's I'm, all your fault. I'm, I'm up and down on this issue because sometimes... It really depends. It, it really does depend. I remember when I went to go see The Avengers. It was the midnight screening. And we all were, the Stan and, Lee geeks well, are there. Well, and the, the movie Stan was, Lee was there too. He forever was there to finally play. Like this was way past the time that it was supposed to start. It was past midnight. And I actually have videos posted on my Facebook where people started like singing out Pokemon. <laughs> like that's the like, wrong franchise. <laughs> like, but, it's not even the right country. But what it's the like, fuck? but it's like you know that was that was like fun, you know, because we were all just like in this. We were everybody acknowledged that we were all bored waiting for this film to start. So, like, what is 
when you say the audience, do you mean just like audience today of like what they like? Or are you talking about when you li- physically sit in a movie? I, I, I think, think it's I the think former. They, when they physically, I think oh, they're I referring don't. to when they physically. Sit. I think it's when talking about the audience. theater audiences. I think yeah, it's talking about the exactly. audience that looks for a simple, easily consumed story. Actually, to be honest, it's I really think, a combination of the two. Yeah, it's really it, a combination. I think the article with two people, people fucking talking. <laughs> getting up it's like yes. if you're going to a movie and you're getting up and walking and talking I will punch you in the face <laughs> secondly bringing children into rated R yes. horror movies yes. you are a bad parent I hope you scar them for life and I hope you don't sleep even, even, wor- even worse it's yes. just parents who bring, who bring their little kids and then their little kid starts crying their head off. And they're wondering and then, why. And, and, they, right, and, and also they don't take them out of the scary, fucking loud theater. Yes, yes, they because <laughs> well, they do that let them cry I method, just, which I is just bullshit. Like, uh, the three-year-old Smack when I went to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that was sitting oh next to me goodness. with a bucket of popcorn, and they're thinking, you know, this kid's not too. And the kid like jumps into its their parents' seat, like shaking to death, like the first oh five minutes goodness. of it. And you I just know, slapped them. I was like, your kid is three years old, and you're taking them to see Texas. Chainsaw Massacre. My dad crossed the bunch, line. It was at Westminster, mind you. Oh, and, it was, and when the and you know what kind of people are watching. What kind of people? Because when Leonard here. Skinner came on, one. they went, "Hell yeah, Leonard Skinner, this is my song." No, I, I, I'm sorry. No, yeah, no, I, I don't care who the fuck hears this and whatnot. Carroll County is full of goddamn hicks. Yep. <laughs> and the we thing is, we clearly don't care about the kids. No, <laughs> and also like it, it's not even just like the audience in itself. Baltimore it's also City, the theaters yeah. that show the movies because. Like one of the examples is like you know when when we have the a Nazi at Westminster like that works at the theater. Oh yeah, no, the thing like, is like, really the uh, movie like Rent. Hold on, no. hold on. The movie he Rent. Is. The movie Rent. When it came out, <laughs> oh, uh, like shit. everyone like if, if you don't it's know what movie. The, the thing is like yeah like you know the movie Rent and it's and it's about people with AIDS and whatnot. They did not show it at Westminster because it involved gays. They didn't show. They did not show the remake of the producers for that very because, reason. Really? Because it involves gays. We have a Land lot of Jews and Nazis. We no. listen. Uh, like I live in Manchester, so I don't know. But for a while, the the whatever the head dragon or whatever of the Ku Klux Klan supposedly lived in my town. Oh yeah. So, no, oh, he was yeah. about. He was about. Dragon. No, he was about ten minutes yeah, away from my house. It was fucked up. Himself, the dumbass that. That's fucked yeah, up. but like wow. so. But the I'm head honcho of racism. Yeah, the head honcho of the time was racism. <laughs> but like stuff like that, like. And then another time, I saw, I don't know, another horror movie, I forget. And there was, like, a four-year-old sitting in the back, 10 o'clock at night, but, like, the last showing is packed. And I'm like, on a Friday night, why is this, like, four-year-old sitting here watching a horror movie? power, that's why. And (laughs) this was in Hanover. That's the answer to all things. This was in Hanover, but it's not close. But still, I just be like, you know, like, when I'm... When I was younger, and I mean, sometimes it also depends on the parents, and you know, but you got to be responsible as well. But like, when oh, I was yeah. when I was Absolutely. four, I was watching like the only like maybe close to rated R movie that my parents ever took me to. Maybe I was three. Was Ghostbusters two. <laughs> and I was a different child altogether because I grew up with the Ghostbusters TV, the cartoon TV show, Ninja mm. Turtles, Power Rangers. Yeah. I'm gonna kick the shit out of everything. But my parents w- didn't take me to like horror movies. If I happened to see a horror movie, it was on TV or it was from renting VHS. I was six and I saw the Dracula movie and thought it was fucking awesome. <laughs> I was scared of shit by that movie. Turned into a giant bat that then turned into rats and me, my brother who was four was like, that is the shit. He turned yeah. into a bat to turn into rats. Right. That's just, yeah. that's doubly yeah. awesome. Yeah. He's a special effects artist. And now my brother's a special effects artist when he went to Tom Spaney school. But that's different. Tom Spaney well, kicks ass, by the way. Yeah. The the article is specifically aimed at like the um, <laughs> sort of uh, marketing and like restriction of so choice, was, as mentioned so I was here, right. quoting. I will um, say one thing yeah. when it comes to the audience and whatnot, especially, and it, it, it's, it's not the fact that the audience itself is to blame, it's the studios, because... They cater to the audience? Th- no, it's no. not that catering to the audience, they treat them... Yeah. Like with a lot less intelligence than they deserve, and, and because and that's exactly the point. Like a, a major thing about right now is the fact that and, you know, yeah, sure, like the Avengers and whatnot. Like, you know, these really big movies are coming out. But the thing is, though, we know exactly what this is. Even Joss Whedon said in an interview about the Avengers that there's no reason that this movie should exist because the, the Avengers is a stupid fucking idea. Yeah, they don't. They can't exist in the universe because yeah. if any of them exist. Then they would like all be unnecessary. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, when it comes down to the audiences. 
uh, if the studios constantly believe, and, they, and that's why they keep pumping out the same shit every year, that the audience is stupid and they're fickle, so they will automatically go and see these movies just because. Now, that's why... Because, like, and this goes back to the new Hollywood movement when it came back in the 60s. That's yeah. why they, movies like Easy Rider, Midnight Cowboy, and whatnot, these movies appealed to people because it was real. It was something that wasn't fantastical. Because before then, the Hollywood system was all about musicals, things involving the fantasy world, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Which is fine, but at the same time, it was completely out of touch with the rest of the world. Right. When the 90s hit and Tarantino came involved and whatnot, that became involved with these gritty, ultra-violent type things and whatnot that became that a norm. problems. Of course he does. He's, an, he's insane, but he's an amazing director. <laughs> yeah. If he chose any other profession, he would be he would be uh, institutionalized. Could you imagine him as a therapist? No. But, uh, at the, but at the same time, like, you know, in, in the early 90s, that was the era of, like, you know, the cinema of transgression from Nick mm -hmm. Zed and, and the No Wave movement and also Dogma 95 by uh, oh Lars God. von Trier. Like, it was all about... The things Someone that take place. To Steve Yeager. You know, like, you know, uh, no, I do this shit all on my own. But uh, the thing is, and also like uh, one of the uh, really great example is the movies of Larry Clark. Um, oh, yeah. Kids. Kids. Yeah. Kids is my favorite movie from his. It came out in 95, and it was about the HIV and AIDS crisis in the the early 80s, I mean, the late 80s to the, the, the mid-90s, and how these guys, and it was dealing with real teenage apathy. That movie was rated NC-17 because of all the high sexual uh, content in it, but at the same time, I've seen far worse movies rated R since then and whatnot. What's the studio system? I mean, this have you seen They were made by the Weinstein boy. Corporation, right. the people who made, who released yeah. Tarantino. Those films. Right, but I've, but I've, have you heard the? There's the documentary. This film has not yet been rated. It's my yeah. favorite documentary, yeah. and, like, and and that's yeah. that's the the problem of the MPAA and. Uh, Fuck Jack Valenti. I want to. I want. I want to take his corpse and burn it. But at the same First time, he <laughs> <laughs> who says he's not? Uh, but his cold. Oh the guy's cold. more of a walking corpse than Dick Cheney. His cold. But um. Calm down, man. This is going along. But uh, I don't as, as his lawyer, as his my lawyer and representative, but, uh, I would like to say uh, that. Matt in no way advocates the killing or will accept any responsibility of the killing of Mr. Valiente. I do, though. But I, but I <laughs> do highly that. recommend someone watch a Serbian film and get creative. I don't oh. want to watch a Serbian film. I've heard I of think Serbian Matt, I haven't. Matt, but, don't, uh, do don't do it. Don't do it. No, no, no. That's a completely different podcast in and of itself. <laughs> but uh, and it, just to wrap up my point, it's just the fact that the, uh, and that's why the the independent market is really starting to come back in a way. Like movies like Blue Valentine, the new movie that came out, Compliance and whatnot. Mm -hmm. These things that are real. And, and I'm not saying that just realism is like you know what people are looking for. It's just something that's intelligent, something that has a lot of thought something put into that's it. Something original. Yeah. Right. Uh, 2009, there was a really great sci-fi movie that came out. And it's actually kind of sci-fi sci fantasy. It's called Ink. And yeah, I've, it's I've seen parts of it. yeah, it's like it's 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 it was it was made for uh, about two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it's just a little. yeah, it's a sublime movie. It was really creative. It was something that was also very unique. Um, a really good one also is uh, Gaspar Noé's Enter the Void. Mm -hmm. uh, you like, really love that movie. I love that. It's, it's one of my really favorite films. Movie. But the thing is, at the same time, there's a reason for that because it's so well crafted. It's so well and like. You know for a fact that watching this movie, you're not going to get the money back. It's like watching a Cronenberg movie. David Cronenberg hasn't made a, a, a big profit on his movies since The Fly. Yeah. And But the thing is, at the same time, like he made movie like Naked Lunch. He made movies like, uh, well, Easter Promises is my favorite film I from like him. History of Violence. History of Violence is a really good one. It's much better than the graphic novel series. But it goes back to the fact of the matter is that the audiences want movies. And I'm saying there's plenty of people who want to be passive viewers. And there are plenty That's of movies. Movies that are made that are good that cater to that, yeah, but at the same time, you know there needs to be new things coming involved. Now I'm not saying that like you know the movies that I make are entirely original. They're entire. They're hugely influenced by all the people that came before me. But there's me. a difference and, from and, from just being like but in, being influenced and then hey I'm gonna go and right. just redo, recycling. I'm shit. gonna redo right. RoboCop. I'm gonna redo. Uh, Which is what they are. Doing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Really? But that's the and thing. it looks awful. But that's the thing <laughs> yeah. is like. Like I think the problem is halt citizen. And it's you not, will not make Robocop. And it's it's originality <laughs> is what I have is what I would like to see. So and we do get it, but mm. but not as much but as we should. But in limited. And forms. now, but the thing that's going on now is like 
to give originality now, we have to go outside of our own country. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Hollywood is not like the big thing, like it, you know. Where Hollywood is this old not. decaying whore that has been it, fucked way best, too much. Uh, like a, <laughs> you really uh, like your metaphors. South, yes, I do. We're, we're, we're good friends with South Korea, am I correct? Gangnam <laughs> Style. <laughs> wait, wait, you're not a fan of North great, Korean no, amazing there films? There's a lot of great um, movies the Dear that I've is seen the greatest director ever. from South Korea. Um, like the host and all. This. Oh yeah, uh, Thirst is really great. Thirst is a great um, movie. Uh, Tale of Two Sisters, I believe, is a yeah. South Korean film, or no, it's, or it's Vietnamese. I'm not sure. Another uh, The Raid Redemption, Indonesian. <laughs> Oh my god, it's like the greatest action movie I've seen this year. And that's also, uh, I've heard a lot of good things about it, but also at the same time, like, Americans have a a nasty habit about, and actually I'm looking at you, Mike, I'm looking at you, this goes back to the whole thing about foreign films, people have problems reading fucking subtitles. I'm sorry. No, 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 to be honest, (laughs) actually, no, I I, I do understand, I I can understand I'm sorry, my attention is taken away from the screen to read text at the bottom. I agree. That, that's, like, by that's, way, my interest that's why in you got to learn how to read with your when, peripheral when vision. Occasionally, I mean, yeah, but when it's the whole film, when it's every line of dialogue, that is what it becomes. That's why you bugging. watch it first, you yeah, read it all, and then you watch it again, and you get all of them, and then yeah, it pieces all of that together. Just to enjoy a film. Oh. That's, should never be the case. Like, a uh, point of that is that me and Sandra were watching M today. Good movie, you guys should see it. Yeah. yeah. Prince Lang's M, 1931. And like, it's one of my favorite movies. For and like one of the scenes, like has a group of robbers and a group of policemen talking about this guy that they want to catch, and because of the subtitles, I did not realize that they've been cutting back and forth until like the sand. I noticed it that out. when it was the police, the table was rectangular, and when it was the thieves, the table was circular. And I thought up until we both thought up until that point that the the pol- that the thieves were so upset with being blamed for the murders that they met with the police. <laughs> because because that's what I thought it was. You know, I'd, I'd be reading the subtitles occasionally, I look up and see their faces, back down to the subtitles. Yeah. See, the, <laughs> I guess it's different because when it comes down, especially to foreign films, like, uh, I've, I've seen so many that I've gotten yeah. to a point where I've... I, you, I, you, I, you read with your yeah. peripheral vision yeah. and whatnot, or else you read it and you can see the rest of what's going on with your per- peripheral vision, or else, by like the bottom line of it, is the fact that you read the subtitles very but, quickly. But my, but my DVD, view, you get the but, English. But my view of it oh, is, yeah. you shouldn't have to do all that. That's the, to that's enjoy the last film. resort. That's the last you resort. Have to but do all the thing that is, though, sometimes I wish maybe because that's what a lot of that's what I mean. Other countries do it with our movies. Yeah, they do it all the time. It's just okay. us that have a problem with everybody else because we don't. Want America. Oh, but, yeah, but but and no, that's because... fine. But I wish that maybe even though people are like, well, just read the subtitles, you know, or go on the DVD to do, you know, get the English oh. overview. I, I sometimes I wish maybe they should just instead of the subtitles just dub it, you know, with the English. Because maybe then that will bring. Well, the Italians more. do, then, do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but, then, but then you face the problem that every anime fan with faces. Bad dubbing. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. But that, that though, is but, no, no but that's not the the yeah. fault of the original makers. That's the fault well, of the right, voice company right, because but, they don't right, give two right, shits about it. Yeah, but, the same but if you're experience. going, if you but if you know that you're going and seeing a foreign film, and so you know the the it's not going to match, but right. just so you it'll be better for audience to. It, like with you said, having the problem with that, then you can still watch the movie and still get all of it. And I think that's the problem now with we're having with okay, there's these great you know um, foreign films that everybody else in the world who who sees them you know will watch them and be like, yeah, it's great. And then when it comes to here, oh yeah, you know you might see it in art house, the sun, you know Charles or whatever. Sure, like the Russian sci-fi movie, uh, no British sci-fi movie, Attack the Block or something like that. Well, that's British. That's yeah. British. Yeah. But you even that's not it. doing much play here because the accents are so thick that yeah. we're, we can't and they understand. They did have it. subtitles for some of it, but, but there was I mean, a Russian but one I'm too, saying like, camera. yeah, you can. If they did that, maybe we wouldn't have this problem with all these like, you know, English remakes, which end up probably not being as good. As the original, like I like uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I saw the second one at the Charles, and the other ones, you know. And I just read the subtitles and got used to it. And even though they did a remake and everything like that, I, I still think it was unnecessary because okay, you're That's you're right. doing a remake of sweet, everybody has Swedish accents and stuff. I'll just watch the original. Well, who to be honest, has actually, a Swedish accent. I've heard when it Swedish comes down accent. to me, I I believe that the the, the the remake actually of the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is actually it's, closer it's to the book. It's a lot of yeah. It's but okay. but Numi Rapace I think was better. In its own self. Iffy, but yeah, but that's a yes, but that's, that's a different, different story. story. But I'm saying, right. 
stuff with that, you want to... Right, right. The one point that I will finish up with uh, when it comes down to dubbing and, and the actual uh, watching the movie, like when we all sat down and we wa- and I got you guys to watch Millennium Actress, uh, like that, the reason that I decided to stick with the English dub, even though I much, much prefer the Japanese dub, is the fact that the Millennium Actress is a very, very visual movie. Mm-hmm. It, it is all about the visuals and whatnot. And like, you know, the, the dialogue is really good. And, but the thing is, I mean, obviously, I was suffering personally because the voice acting in that movie was much more subpar than the Japanese. Yeah. It's not that all way in Satoshi Kon's work, but still. And I understand that, but it goes to the point where it re- it's just people going to the remakes. Like, uh, Quarantine was a remake of a really great movie called Wreck. Wreck. And yeah. it literally was shot for shot remade. I'm like, really? just watch watch the original movie. I'm yeah. like, There's it's not of, that yeah. bad. It's like, why? It's like you want to see something shot for shot, but it's like... Just might as well just go and see the original instead of having to wait for it's, it's like let the right one in. It's like watching the American version of Top Gear when you could just watch the British version instead. It's just, you know, I mean, and there's a lot of great movies that I've seen there. For, I saw this one called Headhunters, which is really fucking mm. awesome. Yeah. And I'm not, su- I won't be surprised when they turn it into the American version, but it's just like, it's there, it's available. And some remakes are just awful because like there was yeah. one uh, French film called The Vanishing. That was yeah, uh, uh, really sure. amazing, and it was remade by the same director, and it was fucking awful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think we touched on. I, I actually did skip over one part because we sort of merged it. There was another point in the article that said too much reverence, not enough originality. Yeah, but I think yeah. We, oh, saw, yeah, we, saw, we pretty much we covered that too. On yeah. that, and then we. I said at the beginning it was a top ten list. Their number three was Medea. Medea. Or Medea, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't. Or, no, no, that's, 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 that's Big Mama's house. Big Mama's house. <laughs> that, Big that's Mama. what it was. That, that was saying one of the worst things about cinema. Um, we posted this discussion on my UMBC and just reading off Tyler quickly Perry just a few just, um, yeah. other comments so too. Um, so Ahmad Sad says uh, one of the worst things is lack of plot development. Oh, Alexander yeah. Schwarzenberg says. Michael Bay and Mike Shyamalan. <laughs> pretty, pretty simple and to the point there. Um, Gimmicks. Bor- Gimmicks is Boris, a big thing. Uh, I think Boyko said uh, too many recent movies just about visuals and action. They're a decent distraction for a couple hours, but no real substance. So, I, I mean, Michael gotta, Bay? Yeah, again, yeah, see? Michael Bay, Michael Bay. and Night Shyamalan. Uh, Explosions <laughs> and lens flare. All right. That's J.J. Abrams. Yeah. <laughs> That's like both of them. And with that, I think we finish our list. Woo-hoo. Yay! Yay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think yeah. we're going to I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for joining uh, the Filmmakers Anonymous show. Once again, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on YouTube, all of our social media that I'm going to keep banging to your heads every single time we have a podcast. It's the <laughs> best podcast in the world. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining the Big Show. See you next time.